after they, the police found out he had an alibi, they started uh, manipulating the evidence and the medical, the medical examiner, based upon the fact there was rigor mortis in the bodies, believed that initially that the victims couldn't have been dead more than two or three days. And Leonard had an alibi for eight days before. So they, they got the medical examiner to change his testimony, and which is rid ridiculous as a matter of forensic science that they could have been dead eight, to, eight days to two weeks. And uh, mm. it's uh, that w that was just uh, I think a really big issue of prosecutorial misconduct that we're advancing along with uh, the uh, claim that he's actually innocent. And this was his girlfriend and his girlfriend's uh, three children. Right, right, that's correct. And that and they were and shot, correct? They were all shot. Um, they never found the murder weapon. Um, there were no eyewitnesses. The evidence was totally circumstantial. Uh, the thing that there are a couple other things that I, uh, that got him convicted. They they focused in on his brother, who was a over the road truck driver, because they got cell phone records that showed they talked a lot during this period of time. Um, and he and they arrested him in the four days after the. They arrested him in New Jersey. They arrested him in Atlanta and put threw him in jail and interrogated him. And uh, he he said, I don't know anything about this. And then when he got back to St. Louis, they arrested him again, charged him with hindering prosecution and and badgered him for about three hours. And then he to told them that uh, Leonard had told him that he had done it, but or had shot the victims. But there are a lot of facts there to that what he told them could have not possibly been true just because of various wow. things that weren't consistent with the other evidence in the case. And then he recanted his statements at trial. But under Missouri law, you can use prior inconsistent statements as evidence. And that and that's that was the primary evidence they had. Um, and uh, to say that the case was weak would be an understatement. So let me make sure, so what, what was the original date they said, and this is a horrible tragedy, of course, a horrible, horrible tragedy, of course, my condolences go out to the family, uh, it's really disturbing. What was the original date they said the, the woman and her three children were murdered before the medical clear, examiner changed his mind? It was clear before they found out about Leonard's alibi that they thought the uh, victims had to have been killed the the, uh, the day they were found was a Friday, which the, the Friday of the week after Thanksgiving. That timeline is important because uh, uh, because of the time of death, the state of decomposition, the fact that it's really well settled that rigor mortis sets in shortly after death, and then it disappears within about three days. So they they would have had to been killed uh, probably the is at the earliest, probably the Monday or Tuesday after Thanksgiving, and Leonard was gone, had left town the Friday, the Friday or the day after Thanksgiving, which would have been, wow. so he had an al airtight alibi for eight days or before the bodies were found. And once and they, the once, once, once they uh, found out about that, they, they, uh, they did everything they could to try to discredit the witnesses who said they saw uh, the victims alive the weekend after Thanksgiving and then the Monday, Monday after Thanksgiving. And uh, the other thing that I think got Leonard convicted was he, he, he was a criminal. He had a very, very, uh, I think that's the reason they focused in on him, but he was a, a drug dealer and a fraudster basically. And he, he traveled under an assumed name. And when they arrested him, he had a bunch of fake IDs and other things. But that's that's what he did. He was on parole for forgery. What he did was he he uh, got fake IDs and forged checks and credit cards. And that that was what he did. So that but they they made it into the reason he was doing that was because he killed these people and was on want to be uh, 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 caught which 
Um, there are certainly other probably more plausible explanations. So, so basically you've got the recanted statement of his brother and that, and that's basic. They had no physical evidence. The gun was wow. never recovered. And there was and, actual uh, footage of him at the airport, right? Right. Before, oh. before, we, before they believed the murder happened, there was actual footage of him at the airport. Right. He's on, he's, he's on video boarding a plane at 8 a.m. the Friday after That's Thanksgiving, crazy. which was eight days before the bodies were found. That is crazy. And, and he was going where? Uh, L.A., Los Angeles. He actually, uh, the the other, uh, actually, he had a wife in Los Angeles. Uh, I guess to to say Leonard uh, was was, was uh, quite a ladies' man. Um, mm -hmm. But and the other problem problem was that there was really no motive for this. He he uh, he was involved in some criminal drug drug and other illegal activity. He, he left town a lot during that period of time. He had some things going on in Kentucky and Atlanta, uh, Los Angeles. And they also didn't look at a couple of alternative suspects. One is that he had uh, told the lady who took him to the airport that this gang called the Black or the Gangster Disciples from East St. Louis were gonna were out to kill him because of a drug drug deal gone bad. And that's why he was leaving town. And you know we verify that that gang has been active in St. Louis since the six East St. Louis mainly in the, since the '60s. And I, ironically, there's a big racketeering trial starting today or, or uh, in St. Louis involving a bunch of these guys. Um, so it's uh, there's a lot there. I mean, uh, and basically what we're trying to accomplish is there's a new law that allows the prosecutor to file a motion to give a, someone who has a claim of innocence a hearing to allow them to try to prove their innocence. And that's what we're asking for. It's, and there's a conviction integrity unit in St. Louis County that was recently formed. And so we're trying to make our case and hopefully we'll know by next week whether they're gonna do that or not. So again, the date of execution of, of Leonard is February 7th. Leonard Taylor is supposed to be executed February 7th. And he's saying he did not commit this crime. And there's, there appears to be evidence that something went wrong for him to be convicted. How did he even find out that he was a suspect? I mean, he's a thousand miles away in California. I mean, I'm, how, did, how did he even find out that, oh, we're, we're, we're pointing the finger at you? Um, I don't think he found out until he was arrested. Um, mm. And that was, that's another interesting thing. His brother's statements could not have been true because he, he told the police uh, that Leonard admitted, first admitted to him that he killed these, uh, all four of them, uh, two days before Thanksgiving when uh, they, when the, the uh, victims were seen alive. And in fact, all three kids were in school on that day and the day after. Um, he also said that the reason that he shot them or he told them the reason he shot them is because she had stabbed him. And that's, and he shot her, and the girlfriend, and then had to shoot the kids because he didn't want to leave any witnesses. But um, problem with that is, is when he got arrested, they stripped him naked, took photos of his entire body. He didn't have a scratch on him. Uh, and it looked more like there was no evidence of a struggle. There was no evidence of, uh, of uh, a knife being found at the crime scene. And uh, it looks more like an execution style uh, killing, which what I think probably happened was that the, these, these, uh, this drug gang went to his house to kill him. He wasn't there, so he killed his, they killed his family, um, which is not a, not a rare scenario in these types of situations. Uh, and uh, there was also some evidence that he had left some drugs and money in the house and they were gone when the police did their crime scene investigation. And I want to say for people who might be confused, well, his brother said he did it after being pressured. I've interviewed people where girlfriends 
said that uh, someone committed a crime. I interviewed one guy where his father said he committed a crime. Uh, being pressured, uh, false testimony is, has a long history. So I just want to make sure that folks really understand that. Sadly, we see that too much. Uh, you may have already answered this, but I just want to zero in on it a little bit. Why do you think they decided to focus on Leonard Taylor? What was their – why not go for the real criminals? I mean, again, there's surveillance footage of him at the airport. I mean, it, it appears, like you said, airtight alibi. What's their reason for coming after him? Well, I think uh, it's a natural tendency anytime someone uh, – a partner or a wife or a spouse is found murdered, usually the number one suspect is the husband or boyfriend. Uh, that's just the way uh, the police operate. And as soon as they figured out that Leonard was not a uh, so-called solid citizen, he had a criminal record dating back to, to the 80s, uh, and um, that they they focused in on him to the exclu exclusion of anyone else. And actually, the, the, they, they didn't even really take a serious look at the father of the, uh, of the kids who, to say the least, uh, he had a turbulent relationship with, with Angela, the, the girlfriend. Um, there was evidence that he'd abused her. She had an order of protection against him, and they were quarreling about the kids. and in the days and weeks before the, before the killing. And uh, in fact, uh, he, had re he had learned that he'd been paying child support for years on one of the children that he wasn't the biological father of. So that I, don I don't necessarily think that he did it, but they didn't make any effort to, to try to at least take a look at, at him as a possible suspect. And it would seem to me that uh, and the, probably the reason they didn't was because they knew Leonard had a criminal record. In fact, he was on, uh, he had a warrant out for him for a parole violation on a forgery conviction. So uh, that would be another reason that he would be using a fake ID. But, uh, but it was it was basically, they just had tunnel, it's police tunnel vision, what I like to call it. It's a, they pick out a suspect and then try to build a case which is totally backward from what they ought to be doing, which is let the evidence collect all the evidence to point to a suspect and uh, then uh, then decide whether to do that. But the the video of uh, Perry, his brother's interrogation is is really interesting because the police really did some they basically told him at one point said, what you say in the next 20 minutes is going to affect you the rest of your life, meaning they, mm. they're going to throw him in prison for a long time. And he, he said off, off, off camera, Perry said that when his recantation that they promised to release him, if he, all he had to do was tell him that Leonard told him, he did, told him that he did it. And lo and behold, as soon as he did that, they let him go. Um, wow. So, um, and he was looking at at least seven years in prison on the hindering prosecution charge. So it's clear what happened. They, they had followed him across the country. The police pulled him over. He was an over the road truck driver, pulled him over in Atlanta, pulled him over in New Jersey. And then this was the third time in four days they'd arrested him. Um, so it's, uh, it's an amazing story. Uh, as I often say in some of these cases and I've uh, handled my career, it's truth is stranger than fiction. Yeah. Uh, again, his execution is scheduled in less than a month, February 7th. How is, how is he doing? How is Mr. Taylor doing? He's, he's doing great. He's, um, he's actually uh, probably the best advocate he has for himself. I've, I've been a criminal defense attorney for since the eighties and, he tells one of the most convincing stories I've ever heard from anybody who's, who claims uh, any convict or criminal defendant who claims he's innocent. Uh, I'm usually pretty good at ferreting out what is BS and what is true. And he tells a very believable story. And actually, we are encouraging uh, the press and there's reporters that are interviewing him. Uh, and we're actually very, very strongly encouraging the prosecutor 
to go talk to him in person. If they aren't convinced he's innocent, then I, uh, I think anybody who listens to him and his story will be convinced. What What is the argument from the prosecutors? I mean, we're talking about a man's life here. At a bare minimum, at a bare minimum, he should not be executed. There needs to be, I don't know if it's another trial or more time, but what's the argument less than a month to take a man's life when there's clearly evidence that he could po- there the reasonable doubt so what's their argument they 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 say uh, despite overwhelming evidence to the contrary that the evidence against him was solid or, which i think is is uh, ridiculous um one thing they point pointed to uh, another thing was there was an absence of phone activity uh from the victim's phone for about from about Thanksgiving on, but uh, and they had some records that they introduced to that. And what we found out after during one of his earlier appeals that during that time period, uh, she had a charter communications, which is a cable company. They just started phone service like a few months before, and uh, it turns out their re- the records that they provided, they've started sending out disclaimers saying it doesn't record. Our records didn't get all calls because they'd be forwarded through roaming and other numbers and other carriers. And so the trial, the prosecutors said these these records were gospel. And then it comes out later that these records are not accurate. Um, and they use that to discredit some of the people who saw saw the victims alive or talk to her on the phone and also to suggest that Leonard was, Leonard didn't try to call because uh, he knew she was dead. Um, and um, so it's, uh, I think all of, all of the circumstantial evidence that they used, and it was all circumstantial except for arguably his brother's statement has been discredited. And, uh, and that's, that's one of the issues that, you know that uh, at the very least, I mean, uh, um, you can't execute a guy when there's a, any doubt of, that they're guilty. Um, exactly. And uh, so, but I think I think it's pretty clear that he's he's completely innocent. And this is why I don't support the death penalty because if anybody is wrongfully convicted and they lose their life with this death penalty, there's no coming back from that. I've interviewed people who've been exonerated after 44 years. I mean, this is, this is, yeah. Uh, how did you get involved in this case, Mr. Gibson? Um, I was appointed to do his uh, federal habeas corpus appeal, which uh, um, is usually the final, final appeal. And if a person loses that appeal, then, uh, they're facing a serious execution date, which is what has happened um, here. Uh, the problem is, and, and you, he had had two state court appeals where the public defender was involved in those, but under Missouri law and uh, under federal law, at least as interpreted in the Eighth Circuit, uh, which is the court that has jurisdiction over Missouri, you can't raise a, a freestanding claim of innocence. If they're not cognizable. So. We've got a couple of other options in state court if the prosecutor does not uh, invoke this new law to give him a hearing before the trial court. Um, and um, so it, it's it's going to be interesting to see what uh, how this plays out, because uh, if the prosecutor agrees to invoke this new law that's only been in effect for about a year, uh, I think he's the the he should she should get an automatic stay of execution but with the current composition of the courts. Uh, nothing's a sure thing in this business. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, I'm not sure if you can answer this, but I want to throw this your way. Um, black men are seven times more likely to be wrongfully convicted in the criminal justice system. Uh, you've been doing this work for a long time. Uh, do you think in, 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 in your client's case, 
there is some intersection with race, with with poverty, with class. Um, in his case, the reason why he is being targeted in this way. Well, uh, interestingly enough, there was a man who got executed in November, also from St. Louis County, who, uh, and there wasn't any doubt that he was guilty, but that he had a very compelling case, particularly St. Louis County, which has, is uh, where Ferguson is, if you remember that situation a few years ago that sort of spawned the Black Lives Matter movement. To, the prosecutor for the last 30 some years until he was ousted by a progressive had a had a uh, notorious track record for probably be pursuing death sentences uh, in the Kevin Johnson case that I alluded to they put on evidence that that involved the killing of a police officer that he went for the death penalty and all of the killings of police officers involving a, a black defendant but in the ones where white defendants were accused of killing cops, he waived the death penalty. Um, wow. But, and uh, he, uh, St. Louis County is sort of the equivalent of, for Missouri, of, of Houston and Texas, where uh, because of rabid pro-death penalty prosecutors, they, they, they contributed probably more people to death row than any other jurisdiction in the state and by, by a wide margin. But, um, and so that, that's uh, the fact, and the, Missouri only has 17 people left on death row, but in the 90s, they had more than 200, which is good. They're, the death penalty is going out of fashion, but the majority of them that are still there are out of St. Louis County. And the, the last two executions, one was just last week, and one in November was from St. Louis County. Um, so uh, we're now in a place that ousted McCullough, the prosecutor in 2018 ran on a, uh, as a progressive prosecutor and one of his promises was to seriously uh, try to correct wrongful convictions. And we know there are a lot of them uh, from the prior regime uh, has promised to do that. And so far, uh, he hasn't utilized this new law to get anybody out. So if this isn't an appropriate case for uh, using this new law, I don't know what, what case could possibly be stronger. Have you ever re represented somebody who you believed was innocent and they were executed? Yes. Um, I had a case probably about 30 years ago. I get, the man got executed in uh, 1993 and uh, his name was uh, Larry Griffin, and there were some uh, there were some articles written about it at the time, uh, and I I'm I'm convinced he was innocent, uh, and, uh, and there are some others uh, other Missouri cases that I wasn't directly involved in. I think they they have probably executed four or five uh, persons that are innocent, which and I think since the death penalty was reinstated back you know, 40 odd years ago or 40 years ago. Missouri's executed, I believe, 95. And so that would be in line with a couple of recent scholarly studies that say that uh, about 5% or maybe a little more of everyone convicted of a serious crime in this country is innocent. So uh, that is just terrifying. That is terrifying. So I have a very active, engaged audience. Um, is there anything my audience could do, should do? Is there a call we should make or should folks just take a step back? And I don't want to, we don't want to agitate anything, but is there anything my audience can do? Well, I think uh, they just need to keep an eye on the case. The case has already generated a lot of publicity in the, the media in this area, but I think it's going to go national here pretty soon. And uh Follow the case. If, if for some reason the prosecutor doesn't use this law, it's, he's got there's there's only two other ways we can stop him from being executed, which would be in the Missouri Supreme Court or the uh, seeking uh, clemency from the governor. So if it comes to that, uh, people should contact Governor Mike Parson's office. It's, he's easy to find and give give him their opinion. 
Well, I want to thank you for coming on and spreading the word about this really important story. Again, I normally cover folks who are exonerated, uh, but there's obviously steps to being exonerated. And I hope that that Leonard Taylor, I hope that he, I hope the right thing happens. I mean, again, his date of execution is February 7th, less than a month away. And I also want to thank you, Mr. Gibson, for, for your work. You're obviously doing God's work, man. And I can imagine it must take a toll on you. You mentioning the person who was executed 30 years ago. I mean, I want to thank you. I mean, this is, this is what I talk about when I say we have to collectively work together. So I really want to thank you uh, on behalf of my listeners for doing <clears throat> the work. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank you for having me.